Well, hi, and welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. Thanks for being here. We really appreciate you taking the time to listen to us. Today, we have Linda Hunt as our guest. Linda is an award-winning accessibility consultant. She's a podcaster. She's an author. And she now is a politician. She's a member of a city council. We're going to have to learn more about that. And she also happens to be a person with a physical disability. So we have lots that we can talk about. And we hope that this will inspire and educate. And uh, I'm certainly looking forward to it. I hope all of you are as well. So, Linda, welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. Well, thank you, Michael. And thank you so much for having me. Well, it's really a, a pleasure. Let's start, as I love to do, tell me a little bit about you growing up and just where you came from and kind of what got you to uh, what you do as an adult. Yes. So I'm, uh, I'm a Scottish lass, actually. I was born in uh, Scotland and I immigrated to Canada when I was about two with my parents. Um, and uh, they came to Canada with me as a two-year-old, had two other children, and then my, my mom was homesick. So we moved back to Scotland and I uh, uh, actually started school here I started kindergarten here but when I went back to Scotland I went to school um, for a few years and came back when I was in grade three so I've I've been here um, ever since I was about eight years old um, and as far as uh, you know growing up did the did the traditional uh, school I graduated high school in the depression of the early 80s and my parents couldn't afford to send me to post-secondary education. So I got a job. Um, well, I had a job in high school that became a full-time job. And, uh, and then I uh, started working actually for Superior Court um, when I was only 19 years old. So following that, I um, decided to pursue post-secondary education. So I have a degree in business administration, which took me 10 years to get um, before the days of online learning. I had to commute um, almost an hour uh, each way to actually attend university. So that's, uh, you know, that's kind of what got me as, as far as my post-secondary education. I have uh, two children. They are grown. They're 25 and 30 now. And, and wow, that was a, that was a, forget my own birthdays. <laughs> my son turning 30 was, uh, was a, a milestone for me, which was just at the end of November. Um, but uh, so, and professionally, um, I mentioned I spent 15 years working in Superior Court. My husband and I had opened our own business in uh, 1990, which we've had for uh, just coming up on 33 years. Um, I myself um, spent a significant amount of time working as a business consultant for the federal government um, and then went on to be executive director of a national health charity here in Canada um, until 2009 when I gave up what I called the commute down the highway for the commute down my office, or sorry, down the hallway to my office, um, which is how I ended up uh, starting Accessibility Solutions, which is an accessibility consulting firm that aids businesses and organizations to remedy barriers for persons with disabilities. So that kind of got me to where I am now from a professional perspective. Um, You've mentioned that I have a physical disability, and yes, I do. I am in a power wheelchair. I was diagnosed in 1999 with uh, multiple sclerosis. For the first five years, I could still jog in high heels. Um, and then we eventually started to see some disability progression um, to the point um, between Early 2006 and late 2007, I went from one cane to two canes, to a walker, to a scooter, to a wheelchair in the span of about 18 months. So adapting, adapting, adapting to disability progression as we moved along. Um, so yeah, that's my history in a nutshell, as we will say. Well, I like the idea of going down the hall to the office, and so do I. Uh, yes. I very much enjoy it. I think it's a, a great thing. I think there's 
a lot of value in being able to work at home. As long as you are able to do it and keep up with what it is that, that you need to do, it, it takes a lot of discipline to work at home. And in some cases, more than even working in an office, although when you're in an office, there's a lot of gossip and talking and interaction that takes place. And some of that's valuable, but working at home is a lot more of a discipline and uh, it, it has its own challenges. It does. I, I, I know when I first started working from home, I, it, that was in, as I said, in uh, 2009, which, I mean, since the pandemic, remote working is, has become um, a norm for a lot of people. But um, in 2009, a lot of people thought if you worked from home, what, what did that mean? You, you went on your computer and then you went and watched, you know, TV or, or did something along those lines. Um, but I, I did miss the, um, as you said, the, the water cooler, the gossip. I missed the interacting with other adults. Um, and so I've really embraced, um, especially since the pandemic zoom and being able to connect with people like yourself, um, who we would never be able to connect in person just because, um, of geography, but mm -hmm. uh, it's certainly become, uh, uh, the norm for a lot of people to be working from home. And you're right. Um, I, do tend to take a little bit of a break around 4.30, but I quite often am back in my office um, at about six o'clock till, you know, maybe eight o'clock. So one of the things that I find about working from home um, is, is almost like you live at work because for me, the temptation to go into your office and maybe do something or catch up on something that you didn't finish earlier in the day is just right there. And that can be a good thing, and and it can also be a thing that you have to watch, of course. But uh, I've in my career had several jobs where I have done a lot of things remotely, as it were. Um, I remember starting out working. Well, my first job was actually involved with a device called the Kurzweil Reading Machine for the Blind, and literally, I traveled all over the country for eighteen months where we in the National Federation of the Blind placed machines in various places. So right from the outset, I did everything kind of remotely. So I would interact with people where we put machines, but the other people within the organization and within the, the process of my job responsibilities within the organization was all remote. So I got used to that. And then I went to work for Kurzweil in an office and uh, that was great until I was asked to relocate to California to help Kurzweil integrate with Xerox on the West Coast. And there uh, I was, again, in a situation where pretty much for three years, my office was really a room in my home. So I got used to that pretty early. Uh, but I do like both settings. I think there's value for both. So I'm I'm glad that you're you're able to succeed at doing it. You seem to be pretty comfortable working down the hall, as it were. Yes, yes, I uh, I really I really am, and it and um, I I do a lot of work with companies around inclusive hiring, and it makes a big difference from an inclusive hiring perspective um, to have uh, to have your workforce be able to work remotely. Yeah. So when you worked for the Superior Court, what did you do? Um, I was a, um, I started out as the deputy clerk of small claims court, which is uh, uh, basically, I think at the time when I first started, it was small claims under $1,000. And I think it went to $3,000 in today's, you know, um, realm it's somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty five thousand mm. dollars but it, it was basically civil litigation um so i was a uh, a court services um representative so basically in a in an environment where no one was happy to be there but the other thing that superior court in uh, ontario canada at least uh does is um uh trials that get basically bumped from provincial court. 
So things like murders and that kind of thing. So Superior Court, um, while we do a lot of civil litigation uh, there, um, also has a very high-end uh, criminal. criminal component. Mm -hmm. So I would um, do a lot of the work around juries. Um, and, well, basically it's, it's paperwork. There's anything to do with the court system or anything to do with law or legal work has has lots and lots and lots of paperwork um, kept you busy with it. Yeah. What? Yeah. And I mean, I, as I said, I started there when I was 19. I mean, I left when I left there, my daughter was only uh, two. Um, so, you know, I really grew up in that role. Um, and as I said, the, that was the time frame that I uh, was also commuting to get my degree. So when my, you know, I would be working, you know, nine to five at the courthouse and then leaving uh, to drive to uh, university for a lecture two nights a week. So, yeah, it certainly kept me busy back then. What made you decide to leave that and start your own business? Well, my so um, my husband was the production manager for a screen printing company for 12 years and um, it was the decision to start our business um, was more a result of um, his business expertise and he was working in a family business he was fairly young um, he wasn't quite 30 yet but he was working in a family business where at the age of 30 he realized that he was never going to go any higher than he was because it was all family members above him. Um, so we talked about it and, um, and then we had a, a good friend of ours that worked for a company that was looking for um, a, a new screen printer. So it, it was kind of a, it was good timing. It was, you know, maybe I can do this. And then almost like a ready-made customer base, if you want to call it, that uh, that presented the opportunity. So we did. So we decided that he would start that. Now, keeping in mind, um, at the time, I worked at Superior Court. So I always had um, the backup full-time job, we'll mm -hmm. say. So it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't a total leap of faith. I mean, I had the job with the benefits. and uh, But anyway, we, it, our business has been uh, very, very successful. So other than um, when I left Superior Court and my daughter, as I said, was, uh, well, she wasn't quite two. Um, there was a, maybe a five-year span in there that I worked full-time in the business. But at that point, we had two locations 16 employees and and things were you know very very busy um and then i decided to when when my daughter went to school is when i decided to uh to go and work um elsewhere which is mm -hmm. when i went to as i said i went to work for the federal government as a business consultant now um, when helping. you talk about the business being a screen printer what exactly is that well if you can imagine you've probably got a t-shirt with a logo on the front of it ah that, that would have been printed in a screen printing facility got it okay yeah so then you went to work for the federal government what did you do for them I was a business consultant. I ran a program called the Self-Employment Benefits Program. And I basically took people that wanted to be entrepreneurs all the way through the um, business planning, market research, marketing plan, getting their business started, um, and then mentored them through their first year um, of business. Um, and I was pleased to say in the in the probably about the four years that I did that, I probably had a hand in launching 200 to 230 uh, small businesses. And um, yeah, I found that I found that very rewarding. So that was really for me, it, it was, first of all, my experience of 
starting my own business, or in my case, my the business that my husband was uh, was running full time. Um, but it was also my uh, my education. So I have a degree in business administration. So, um, but but really that that lived experience of being that entrepreneur that had to write the business plan and um, you know go through all of the steps of uh, um, becoming a business. And I'm I'm pleased to say I I did that in the early two thousands. Um, and there I know of, of, because I've used them, I know of quite a few of the businesses that I helped launch during that time frame that they're still in business today. And we're, you know, talking 15 to 20 years later. So I like to mm-hmm. think that uh, I, I had a hand in giving them a, a great start. So um, how, how long did you do that? I did that uh, for four years in the early 2000s. And at the time, I was sitting on the provincial board of directors for, um, as I said, the, the national health charity that I, that, so what ended up happening is that they approached me um, because they were recruiting for an executive director. So I have a, a degree in business administration, basically was sitting on the provincial board of directors and had the was given the opportunity then at that point to be um, considered for the executive director position. So I um, was successful, um, applied and was the successful candidate and left that, uh, left that position with the federal government to go um, and work as executive director for, for that, uh, that organization, which uh, anybody that's worked in the not-for-profit world knows that at that executive director level, um, it's a lot like running a business. So you've got customers or clients to keep happy, and you've got funders uh, to uh, to keep happy, and you've got uh, payroll to make and marketing to do, and you know all of that kind of stuff. So it is a lot like running a business. So you did that until when? Until 2009, which is, as I said, when I gave up the commute down the highway to the commute down the hallway. Um, and uh, so in 2009 was when I, uh, so I started Accessibility Solutions in 2010. 2009 was a, a tough year health-wise. Um, we had my dad, my father died, and then my father-in-law died a month apart. Um, and we had, uh, health-wise, I was, I was struggling. So 2009 was a, a tough, tough year. Now, were you in a chair by that time? Uh, in 2009, I was still shuffling in the house with a walker. Okay. Um, or what I call furniture surfing. So <laughs> shuffling from one piece of furniture to another, but no, couldn't, uh, couldn't walk independently at that mm-hmm. time. At that time, I was using a wheelchair outside. So I would leave the house, um, get in my wheelchair, leave the house, go down the ramp in the garage, get into my, uh, 2009 was when I bought my wheelchair accessible van. So I still to this day drive. Um, from a wheelchair accessible van that has a side ramp. But um, yes, so I was still living, we were still living in the, you know, the two-story four-bedroom house. At that point, mm-hmm. we had installed a, um, so we talk about adapt, 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 right? So you adapt to your circumstances, can't do that anymore. So what do I need to do so that we can do that? So at uh, At some point in 2006, I believe, I decided that I could no longer climb this uh, flight of 13 stairs to go from the main level of our house all the way up to the bedrooms. So we installed a uh, a stair lift at that point. So when I say I was shuffling with a walker, I was shuffling with a walker on the main level, then I'd get on the stair lift and go upstairs and shuffle with another walker um, around the, uh, the upstairs, the bedroom my office was upstairs at that time. We, uh, yeah, so in 2010 was when I started Accessibility Solutions, which at the time was um, 
primarily related to compliance with uh, the AODA, which is provincial legislation, somewhat similar to your ADA in uh, the United States. So we were helping businesses comply with um, new legislation that was that was coming on stream for businesses in Ontario. And uh, we, while we still do that, we you know we've we've really grown into quite a few other areas of uh, helping businesses. Um, embrace the, well, we'll say embrace the culture of, of uh, inclusion and realize that uh, persons with disabilities are, is really a market that no business can afford to um, ignore. And uh, so we, we have a series of webinars now that we run called Accessibility is Good for Business. Uh, we have some partners with um, the local chamber of commerce and, you know, that kind of thing. So that's, uh, that's really my, my passion now is I'm, I'm a very strong advocate for accessibility um, in, you know, kind of every, every aspect of, uh, of life, I guess, is, is uh, you know, just. Well, tell me, tell me more about your, your concepts of accessibility or inclusion really ought to be part of the cost of doing business? Well, it's, it, well, we, we actually frame it as that accessibility is good for business. So you can enhance your bottom line by being accessible. Why? Well, 22% of the population has a disability. So, and, and then we talk about the sphere of influence of those people. So, I, I'm in a wheelchair, so I'm one of the 22%. But if we're going out for dinner um, or we're going shopping, um, then that sphere of influence might be uh, me and, and a couple of girlfriends or in the case of my family, um, my husband's family is fairly large. So I think our Christmas dinner was uh, 34 people. So when we set out to decide where we're going to go for dinner for 34 people, the number one concern is, is that business accessible? Because if it's not accessible, me and the 33 other people in my husband's family um, are not going there for dinner. So that's, that, that's real dollars, right? That's, that's, you know, that's, uh, like I said, that's real dollars and cents. Um, but the other the other thing that we uh, that we really talk about is the fact that 22% of the population has a disability, but that percentage over the age of 65 is actually 40% of the population. So everybody, you know, whether you're in Canada or the United States, is well aware of what we call the silver tsunami and. Uh, and as the population ages, there are more and more people um, that have a disability. And if you're not accessible, um, and then you're, then you're, you're, you know, those people are not coming to your business, or in, the, you know, they're not coming to your website if it's not accessible to someone like yourself that is blind or uh, or has uh, has vision loss. Um, we, uh, the other thing that, that we do a lot of work around right now is inclusive hiring strategies because the world is short staffed and the um, most underutilized uh, labor market out there are people with disabilities who want to work, but need, um, need to work in organizations that have embraced a culture of inclusion. Um, and so out of necessity, believe it or not, a lot of businesses are recognizing the fact that um, accessibility and inclusion uh, needs to be part of their business strategy. So one of the the conundrums I think that we face, although we don't 
necessarily talk about it is that while we have a significant number of people who happen to have a disability, you said 22%, I've actually heard higher numbers, doesn't matter though. The problem is we have a lot of different disabilities. And so, yes, you have issues where you can't gain access to buildings and I may have issues where we can't access the menu at a restaurant or read material, but they're different. How do we get people within the minority to work together um, or do they? Um, Well, I think they do um, recognizing and, you know, when we talk about universal accessibility, we're, we're talking accessible for everyone. So not just a person with a physical disability, or as you said, not someone that's able to, to read, um, read a menu um, or hear the waitress, for example, you know, giving you the, the specials of the evening at uh at a restaurant, um, it's it's really all about how how a business can accommodate different types of disabilities and how they how they can do it. But it the cult that culture of inclusion really starts at the top. So that there has to be a will for them to want to be able to be inclusive to uh, people um, of all disability, you know, of all types of disabilities. So, um, I, you know, I, I always start with the, you know, how can I help? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's as simple as that. How can I help? What do you need? Um and uh, and then we and then we go from there. But we, you know, I work with a lot of businesses that uh, that are they're just they don't know what they don't know, right? And, and so um, a lot of times, what we think are you know fairly simple fixes um, until they're point if you if you don't have a disability or until somebody points something out to you. Um, then, then you're not even aware. So that awareness for, for one is definitely, uh, you know, j- just being aware that you need to be accessible or you want your business to be accessible. Um, but then also being able to recognize that in order to be inclusive for everyone, um, that there are different ways that you that you need to to make your business accessible well i um i like what you say about it is good for doing business but i also do think that we need to have more of a discussion about the reality that um accessibility and inclusion is is and should be part of the cost of doing business as well because we do so many things in business. Um, we do so many things for one group or another, or for most employees, for example. We have lights so that people can see where they're going and so on, although some of us don't need it. We have coffee machines to make employees happy and so on, and we regard that typically in a business environment as part of the cost of doing business. But if and we, and we provide computer monitors, but if somebody comes along and says, I need a screen reader to hear uh, what's on the screen, um, first of all, they may not even get hired because, oh, that's we don't have budgets for that. Rather than, in reality, it's no different than needing a computer monitor, or um, it is an issue of what's your priority. And so... We, at some point, have to decide that inclusion really is part of the cost of doing business, and that's a good thing. Yeah, I I agree in that. I mean, a lot of times I feel like I'm preaching to the converted, right? Because once once they've decided to seek out the services of an accessibility consulting firm, and I'm sure you deal with this um, as well, that, you know, once they've decided that they're 
going to make their website accessible and they've come to to see or, or talk to you about uh, about your services, um, you know, they've made that conscious decision that they want to build accessibility and inclusion into their business, which is great. There are, though, um, at least in the province of Ontario, Canada, where we are, um, there are laws that require businesses to be accessible. And unfortunately, um, that legislation is probably one of the most non-compliant pieces of legislation out there um, because um, it's what I call the carrot and the stick, right? Like people, first of all, they don't know. I've had so many businesses say to me, well, I don't think that legislation applies to me. <laughs> and I say, well, actually it applies to every business in the province of Ontario that has at least one employee. Um, or they'll say, well, we don't have customers. Well, that, that doesn't really matter. I mean, your purulator delivery guy could have a hearing impairment and that qualifies as, as uh, or your, your website's not accessible or, you know, whatever, uh, whatever it is. So it's, it's not about the legislation um, was, was actually passed in 2005 to make the province of Ontario fully accessible by 2025. Well, we've got under two years to go. And we are nowhere near uh, where, where we were supposed to be. Um, and a lot of that, you're right, has to do with businesses who don't realize that building in accessibility and inclusion is, is a cost of doing business. How do we get, um, speaking of the whole issue in Canada, how do we get that to be more of a national initiative why is it a provincial one? I know that I've had discussions with people in various provinces about guide dog access, and um, some provinces do better at that than others. But why is it that we are not able to get this to be more of a national movement? Yeah, we, um, we just in 2019 actually passed the uh, Accessible Canada Act. Um, unfortunately, though, the Accessible Canada Act, which was, which was also a very welcomed piece of legislation, but um, it's, it's only, it only regulates federally regulated industries, such as banking or um, airline trans, uh, transportation or, you know, those kind of federally regulated um, industries. So the provincially regulated industries and I'm, I'm lucky that we're in Ontario because we were actually the first that, uh, that brought out legislation. And ours is called the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, um, which is comp initially was comprised of five standards. Um, we have two other ones that are working their way through uh, being, uh, being adopted now. But... Um, the, you know, to answer your question, how do we, you know, I, I sit on, I sit on the board of Citizens with Disabilities Ontario. We do a lot of work around um, advocating for, first of all, just compliance with the legislation that we do have in the province of mm -hmm. Ontario. But then, yeah, you, you, you cross the border and you go into another province and uh, in some cases, there are some provinces in, the, in uh, Canada that don't have accessibility legislation. Yeah. But then there's, then there's the whole question is, <laughs> why do we need legislation? Like for, for those of us in the, who work in the disability space, um, it, it should just be, uh, you know, nobody should be allowed to put up barriers. I mean, you know, you've got our, our, our disability legislation is actually companion legislation with the Ontario Human Rights Code. So the complaint mechanism is, is kind of tied with being able to file an Ontario human rights complaint if 
someone's not complying with with the legislation. So, you know, which is which is a a long drawn out process for something that should just never happen. And, and that that's where we get into disability rights. And you know, people have a right to to housing, they have a right to, you know, uh, the same services that are available to uh, to persons who who don't have the same disability as them, you know that that type of thing. But you know that you know I, sh- I think you and I are probably going to be long gone for this wor- from this world before everybody gets on the same page and realizes that accessibility and inclusion should just be built into everything from the start. Yeah, um, it certainly would be less expensive if it were, which is, I know, something that you think about and that you talk about, building yeah. inaccessibility as opposed to having to deal with it later. And yeah, certainly one of, one, my, of the- one of my comments or one of my uh, quotes that I, it's, it's accessibility is cheaper to build it in than it is to bolt it on. <clears throat> well, Absolutely. And it is an issue where if you, for example, especially for physical disabilities where mobility is involved, if you have to modify a building or a structure after the fact, it's extremely expensive. And my wife and I built houses to avoid a lot of those costs. So our most expensive home from a standpoint of adding an accessibility that is to a home we built was when we moved to New Jersey, we had to spend an additional $15,000 to put an elevator in because all the homes in the area were two-story homes. But even that became a selling point when we sold the house and moved back to California. But in reality, like the home we're in now that I'm in now, my wife actually passed away in November. So we were going to be married 40 years on the 27th of November. And we missed it by 15 days. But oh, when so we built this, man. when we built this house, uh, there were no real extra costs because of the fact that you design it in. Um, and that's in general true. Um, I work for Accessibly, a company that makes products that help make websites more accessible. And um, Accessibly will tell you that if people would design in the inclusion to make websites accessible from the outset, if the basic manufacturers of those tools would design in accessibility and inclusion, it would be less expensive. Um, But that isn't the way we work today. And so we do have to have solutions that work like Accessibly to make sure that Websites are usable and include all people. Exactly, and I and you know I'm I'm totally in agreement with you in terms of housing. I mean, we've uh, um, I've I've done some work with the Accessible Housing Network here in Ontario, um, and there is a there's a there's a true crisis in accessible housing. Um, and then, well, there's a crisis in affordable housing. Yeah, the crisis in accessible affordable housing is is just you know that's that's a whole other uh, whole other thing. And the sure. interesting thing is is that uh, the accessible housing network will tell you the exact same thing that you just referred to as building a single family home is that it doesn't cost any more to build it with 36 inch doors and, you know, whatever accessibility features you need at the outset. Well, it's the same if you're building an apartment building, it doesn't cost anymore when you're building an apartment building to build it with 36 inch doors and, you know, those type of accessibility features. But what people always seem to think accessibility is, is like a little add on or something we have Mm -hmm. to do. And that's something that needs to change so I've just been elected to municipal council, but I'm I'm one of the ones that will push that challenge as to we're building a 45 unit affordable housing complex and four of the units are going to be barrier free. So I will ask the question, well, why don't we make all 45 units? That, that was going to be my question. Yeah, 
because it's not going to cost any more when you're building it. And I, I don't know anybody that doesn't need a 36 inch door that has a problem walking through one. Um, so, you know, accessibility doesn't offend people. And from that perspective, um, you know, why aren't we building, as I said, all 45 units with that accessibility feature? How do we change the basic conversation? I mean, we hear all about diversity and diversity is always about sexual orientation, gender, race, and so on. Disabilities are not included in that traditionally, while the minority group of persons with disabilities is much larger than any of those, except for gender, um, when you're dealing with male and, and female, um, but like LGBTQ and so on, certainly from a percentage standpoint, um, that population is incredibly significantly less than the population of persons with disabilities, but we never get that included into the discussion. Why is that? And what do we do about it? Yeah, it, it's, it's funny because yes, you, you'll talk to, well, large businesses that have, uh, you know, the, the diversity, you know, inclusion and equity. Well, some of them have entire departments built into mm -hmm. their business. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when you talk about diversity and inclusion, you're right. We, we sh we're not just talking about, uh, you know, gender, race, you know, if you're, if you have a inherent bias within your, within your culture against persons with disabilities, then, you know, that, that's, that's going again, forget any diversity, inclusion, or equity department or policies or procedures that you have. There's, there's still the inherent bias. Now, I, I have actually seen the word or, or the words diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. Those are, um, those are ones that are more forward thinking. Well, a little bit, but I'm not sure it helps a lot because what do we mean by accessibility? And we're not still not dealing with the issue. And I think you're absolutely right. If we look at it at its most basic level, the answer to my question about why we're not included in the conversation is bias and fear. Um, for many years in this country, the Gallup polling organization doing surveys of people's fears found that one of the top five fears people said they had in this country was blindness, wasn't even disabilities. Now that's many years ago, but still the biases are there and whether it's just blindness or all disabilities, we haven't gotten beyond that fear and that bias. And that's the reason that I think we have this issue of not being included in the conversation. Yeah. And if we are, it's just, oh, for the motivation, the inspiration of one person, one, one time, one group, one time. But the bias, the basic prejudice hasn't changed. Yeah, and that's, you know, you're right, like the, the culture of inclusion, and whether it be any uh, marginalized group um, needs to, needs to be, you know, built, it's, it's like anything else, it needs to be built into um, the, 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 you know, whether it be the business, their corporate culture. Um, from the leadership level, um, and then it flows all the way down throughout a business. But if you if you can't get that um, that bias addressed at the leadership level, then unfortunately that that kind of toxic type of uh, type of thinking permeates the entire business culture. So, I mean, I'll, I'll use an example. You mentioned that I was, that I was uh, elected to Brantford City Council in, uh, in October, but I, I actually 
I faced what I'll call, uh, you know, a bias at the door. A very nice gentleman. He was he was elderly, but he didn't understand how I could possibly be a city councillor because I was in a wheelchair. So the the fact that my legs don't work had him somewhat somehow thinking the rest of me had deficits that would not allow me to to hold mm-hmm. that position. And what did you do about that? How well, did you address that? Yes, I had a very nice discussion with them, and I basically said that my legs don't work, but um, that I uh, that I'm in a that I'm in a you know I I my educational background, my you know my you know the fact that I run two businesses, the fact that even as he was speaking to me, I was and as as you can well imagine, uh, being in a wheelchair made door-to-door canvassing, um, which is knocking on individual doors, um, challenging. But here I was knocking on his door. Um, and, you know, so we, we, we basically had the, the discussion. Um, and it, it, it was, it was just an inherent, I mean, I don't think he was doing, he wasn't, in fact, I know he wasn't doing it to be rude or disrespectful, even though it came across that way, but it's, it, I almost felt like I needed to educate him. Yeah. Um, as, as we were having the conversation that, you know, assuming that just because I'm in a wheelchair, I'm not capable of uh, making decision-making processes at the municipal council level. Um, is wrong. How did the conversation end up? I think I got his vote. <laughs> well, there you go. What yeah, more can you because, ask for? Because, and, and you know what, I, I tell people, we, you know, I, I do a signature talk on overcoming barriers to leadership, but, but sometimes when you're faced with, you know, that kind of thing head on, it, it is a lot of times, as you know, as you said, like, People don't know what they don't know, and you need to address the, you know, the, whether it be the stigma or the, you know, the, the in, incorrect um, assumption that, you know, that you are somehow um, inferior because you have a disability. Right. And that's why education is so important. And that's why, among other things, we we used to hear terms like mobility impaired, and I still hear visually impaired, which is wrong on so many levels. And we have to get beyond that rather than equating how much of one thing someone has as opposed to someone else, recognizing that what we have are characteristics. And certainly low vision makes a lot more sense to say than visually impaired. First of all, visually doesn't make sense. And as far as I'm concerned, you're you're blind impaired or you're light dependent, um, which is probably a more polite way to put it. But the the reality is, I think, in answering my question, it is about education. And we have to do it, but we also have to get so many others – um, across the board to become more advocates for this as much as they are for other kinds of things. Yes. Um, and that's where the real challenge begins. And I, and I, and the other thing is, is, is educating, educating um, our, our younger population. So I absolutely love it when, because I always say all the little boys love me because I'm, in a wheelchair and they love wheels. Yeah. So they'll, they'll, you know, they'll tell me, um, you know, how come you're in a wheelchair? I had a little boy um, actually when I was, when I was out a couple of weeks ago that, that said, does that have a horn? And it does have a horn. It does have a horn. I honked (laughs) a horn for him and he was just totally enthralled, but I, I welcome that kind of um, curious initiative of, of children like that. And I think that, you know, like so many other things in schools, um, that, that learning that not everyone is the same and people are different, 
um, is, you know, should apply to persons with disabilities as well. Um, not just, uh, not just whether it be race or, or gender or any of that kind of stuff that, yeah, it, because that's, that's really the versus trying to change the, the way of thinking of mm-hmm. older um, people that, you know, as they become adults, if children grew up thinking that disability was just a normal part of, of life. There are people that have disabilities in our, in our society and there's, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with them or with, with that. And that we need to just be inclusive for everybody. Of course, you probably didn't tell that little boy that, the horn wasn't the greatest thing in the world. It's not no. all that loud. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I got a new wheelchair about two years ago, and it, this one is actually not bad. But the ones that I had before that, my, in fact, my husband, one day was like, I, I don't even know if the person in front of you at the grocery store could even hear that one. Yeah. Um, far less, you know, trying to get, you know, a, a group of people in a crowd to move out of your way. But, um, but anyway, well, I don't use it all that often. I use yeah. I like my, having the escort in front of me. That's kind of saying, excuse me, excuse me. Yeah. She's, she's coming through. My wife's last chair was the pride mobility line of sight chair. Um, so it's three years old and the horn still wasn't all that great. As you said, as far as being able to be heard in a crowded area, on the other hand, you really can't put an air horn on, on a chair either. So it's a compromise. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh... you know, for, for you, um, you have a, a very positive attitude. You've undergone a lot of changes over the years. How, how do you, um, or how did you, and do you keep up a positive mental attitude about everything? Well, you know what, Michael, I tell people all the time, if I, if I didn't have a positive attitude, I'd be sitting in the corner crying somewhere. So yeah. I was I was diagnosed on March the 9th of 1999 which was a l- the internet was fairly new at the time. Yeah. So um I went back to my office after being diagnosed and at the time I I did work um uh my husband and I I was I did have an office in our uh, in our facility and my husband came into my office and said, you know, well what did he say? And I said, "Oh, he said I have MS." Um, And at the time, my symptoms were tingling in my feet and my fingers. So I was convinced that I had some kind of a tumor pressing on my spine Mm. because he kept talking about peripheral nerve damage and that there was something causing, you know, this peripheral nerve damage. So honestly, a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis was kind of like, oh, I don't think I can die from that. So I literally drove back to my office and... Um, was was sitting in my office when my husband came in and, and I said, oh, he said, I have MS. Um, but, you know, which I really don't know what that means. And I will tell you, though, after now 25 years of having MS, this is a disease that does not have a roadmap. So mm-hmm. there's there's no way of knowing from onset to 25 years later. Um, all he did say to me was that, of the people need some assistance walking within 10 years. And that could be a cane to a wheelchair. And as, as I said earlier in our discussion, I went from one cane to two canes to a walker, to a scooter, to a wheelchair in the span of about 18 months. But my positive attitude, um, I think, honestly, it's, it's out of necessity. I mean, I, you know, I, I was diagnosed with, with, uh, uh, children that were like two and seven, like I, I didn't have time to <laughs> wallow in any kind of self pity. Um, and the other thing is, is when I was first diagnosed, um, other than um, an exacerbation that that uh, would you know kind of get me down for maybe about six weeks, which you know they'd, they'd give me some steroids and I'd be up and going again. But um, you know, like I said, I you know just. You know, I was working full time. We had, you know, we had a business. I had two children. Um, you know, so my, you know, I say the the positive attitude 
um, really is what has kept me going like to this day. Here we are 25 years later. Um, but you I, made I the choice. Yeah. yeah you, you, that's you, the you, important part that you, you could have gone the other way. Well, there, and there, unfortunately, there are a lot of people that do go and it doesn't matter what kind of diagnosis sure. you got. I'm sure you're you're an exactly I mean you're a very positive person um uh you know with that has dealt with uh a disability uh yourself for um you know so it's to me it's it's a part of life and as I said you know it, it uh unfortunately um having a a very good support system so my husband has been I mean we were married 10 years when I was diagnosed um so we're coming up on 35 years but you know it it very much is a you know a family disease um Mm -hmm. my my daughter I don't think she remembers much before I was uh, actually, you know, using, starting to use mobility devices, whether it be, you know, a cane or whatever. Um, My son, I think, remembers more. But having that positive attitude is what's enabled me to, you know, to continue to do the work that I do. Um, I've I've just never, I've never let my, my, um, well, we'll call it disability, but I've, I've never let, let the fact that I can't walk like everyone else, and that's really what it is, um, impact, you know, my decision to do whatever um, I want. So as there I said, I, I still drive, I still, I still travel a fair bit. I mean, I do a lot of research before I go places to make sure that there, you know, I'm going to be able to uh, uh, use my lift and my wheelchair is going to get where it needs to go. And, and that kind of thing, air travel can always be a little bit of a challenge, but, uh, you know, yeah, you, you just, like I said, you just carry on. And it's, I I think I've always had that attitude though. It's like, if something gets you down, you just pick yourself up, you dust yourself off and you carry on. So it's, it's as unstoppable as it gets. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> fits so in I, under- I understand you're an author. I am. Love to hear about that. Yeah, so I had the, um, and it, it's funny, I, I never thought of myself as an author um, because the first couple of, uh, the first couple of published uh, documents that I, I had were more what I would consider to be documents. They were policy pieces or uh, so I, I developed um, uh, I, I developed was it the leadership code for the organization that I was executive director of. So I, you know, writing that kind of stuff. But I had the opportunity to um, to be part of a collaborative book um, a couple of years ago. Um, which uh, my my chapter was actually on overcoming barriers to leadership, which is one of my signature talks. And, and you know, we've had that, uh, which kind of feeds into that whole positive attitude and, you know, that, that type of thing. Um, and so, um, yeah, actually, you know, and that book is on Amazon. Um, I, I use it. I uh, use it in my business as a, um, as a, uh, you know, a, a gift, give it away at networking events, that kind of thing. Um, I'm actually working on um, another book now, uh, which will be, which is around the concepts of accessibility is good for business and why. Um, so we've, you know, we've got a couple of kind of chapters that are, that are being flushed out on that. And, and I had somebody, you know, that, that said to me once when I was starting out my podcast was um, to think of your podcast episodes as chapters of a book, um, which was an interesting concept Mm -hmm. because, you know, my, 
my podcast, Accessibility Solutions, Making the World Accessible, is, um, is really aimed at at that business, uh, that business target market, and understanding that uh, that accessibility is good for business. So you know we're hopefully um, by uh, later on this year, then we'll have a I'll have another published book out specifically about um, how accessibility is good for business. Are you self publishing or going through a publisher? No, I'm using the um, the Kindle Direct Publishing okay. through Amazon. That yeah. works. Yeah. Running with Roselle, my second book is, is published through Kindle Direct Publishing. So oh, good. Good. understand it. And uh, that's mm-hmm. that's great. Is your husband still doing the screen printing business? He is. Oh, He's, good. Um, uh, <laughs> although I, I I was after him to retire, but then when I got elected, he's like, "Oh yeah, you're after me to retire," and you just yeah. <laughs> to four years of city council. Um, yeah, I would like to. Yeah, it, and it is a very much a going concern. He, um, as I said, he works from the. Um, we have a, a full production facility, which is um, off off site, about five minutes from our home. Uh, which is where him and all of our production staff work, and uh, I'm actually in the in the process now of um, of bringing on some. I'm trying to replace myself. I'm trying to work myself out of a job, Michael. Um, well, if you can do that yeah. successfully, good on you, as they say, down under. Um, yeah. It it and and it's good to be forward thinking enough to know when it's time to do that. Yes, yes. Um, And I think that's also a key key milestone to achieve in order for us to really be able to successfully sell the business because anybody Mm -hmm. buying a business that has been operated, you know, by sole proprietor or in our case, you know, a a husband and wife team for as long as we have is likely going to want to keep somebody along for the transition. Whereas I tell, <laughs> I tell everybody when the, when the deal's done, I am no longer girl and girl. So um, if I've handed off uh, the, the majority of the work that I do for the day-to-day operations of the business and have staff in place, then that's, that's part of succession planning in my transition. Well, Linda, this has been absolutely fun. And it's been everything I hoped that it that it would be. And I really appreciate your time. If people want to reach out to you, um, talk with you perhaps, or maybe even if you have them available, hear speeches and so on, how do they do that? And I think you also said that you have a free gift. I do have a free gift. So my free gift is, and I'm sure you'll put it in the show notes. We shall. You can, yeah, you can book a, um, a time to just talk with me and I invite anyone to talk with me, um, if, if, whether it's accessibility, uh, you want to talk about accessibility. Um, if I'm, I'm very open to being guests on other people's podcasts or other people's stages. Um, I've done a fair bit of that kind of, uh, that kind of talking over the years, conferences, that type of thing. Um, or if, hey, if you just want to reach out and find out more about what it is that we do, um, then that link to be able to book that free consultation. And can you say the link? Uh, the link is, um, it's a Calendly link. It's. Uh, or can people get to it through your website? People can get to it through my website there and you're going to embed it in your show notes. So yeah. Can- What's your website? They can see it there. It is uh, solutions, the number four, accessibility.com. Um, and they can always, always reach me via email, which is Linda at solutions for accessibility.com. Well, cool. Well, I, again, very much appreciate you being willing to come on and have a good in-depth, and I think good substantive discussion about all of this. And I hope that we're making a difference. Um, I think we are. And the more we talk about the conversation and the more we converse about the conversation, the more conversation we have, which is what we really need to do. I agree. And I, and I so very much appreciate you having me on. I'm, uh, 
I'm a big fan of your show. Well, thank you. Well, I hope that everyone listening feels the same way, and we'd love to hear from you. So if you would, we'd appreciate you letting us know. You can reach me at michaelhi at accessibeaccessibe.com. Or you can go to my podcast page, which is www.michaelhingson.com slash podcast. And we'd love to hear from you. Please give us a five-star rating when you're listening to this. We appreciate your ratings and your views very much. And we hope that this has been educational and gives you some things to think about. And Linda, once more, I want to thank you for being with us today. And we'd love to have you come back and visit some more. Thank you.